25 meters? Hmm? Do I have 25 meters? No, 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 no. Yeah. 20 is the tall spot, I think. Mean, Hello, I'm Jim Feng, a PhD student in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I'm excited to present SIGMET, a classification scheme for gene signature matching. Uh, I work with Dr. Saurabh Stinka uh, and Charles uh, for this project. So what do I mean by gene signature matching? And what is a gene signature? So at least in this talk, uh, when I say gene signature, I mean, the RNA expression level of about 1,000 genes when a human cell line is exposed to a drug. Um, so this is the signature uh, used in the NIH Lynx uh, signature library. And there are also other ways of defining gene, sig gene signatures, uh, but it's irrelevant to today's talk. So this is a definition we'll keep to uh, for today. Matching uh, gene signatures to signature libraries is a very critical step for drug discovery. So suppose uh, we have a mini signature library shown on the right. Uh, in the mini library, we have four samples. And suppose two of the samples are uh, done with drug one, and another two samples are done with drug two. Um, in the figure, being red means a gene is overexpressed under treatment while being blue means the gene is underexpressed uh, upon treatment. So now, suppose we are given a query signature and we want to ask what drug inside the library can induce or reverse the query signature? That's a very typical question that people ask when they try to develop some new drugs. And the traditional approach for this uh, task contains two steps. So first one, people will find similar signatures from the library. So people ask what signatures in the library are similar to your query. In this toy example, the sample two in the library is the most similar one, and sample one is kind of similar, while the other two samples are kind of the reverse of the query signature. That is the first step that people do. And the second step is to rank the drugs in the library uh, with the signature similarity computed before. So again, in this toy example, um, because the two signatures in the library for drug one are more similar to your query, then uh, people will prefer drug one over drug two for this uh, mini example. And we're asking that if our purpose or task is to rank drugs, so do we really need to go through this two-step process? Can we actually build a model um, from the library and then each time when a new signature comes in, can we just use the trained model to rank the known drugs or rank the drugs from the library for any given signature? So that is the spirit of SIGMAT, the classification scheme for gene signature matching. So then the question is, what model to use? We attempted uh, many models and find that uh, the kernel support vector machine model actually worked uh, well for this task. So I will keep to this model um, for this presentation. The performance is good for this. And so here comes our first idea for the signature match ma matching, uh, is to use the kernel support vector machine to do multi-way classification. A kernel SVM is just an example uh, of binary classifiers. And the kernel functions are here defined as the exponential of Spearman correlation between signatures. Uh, we use Spearman correlation because of two reasons. First one, it is popular, uh, easy to calculate, um, and effective. And second one, it is performance is good, okay? And so given a query signature, and each binary classifier will cast a vote towards a drug based on the scoring function showing up here. If you are not familiar with SVM, uh, you don't need to know what exactly this formula means, uh, but the point is that all the parameters here, the W and B parameters are learnable from the training data. And after you have learned the model, then given a new query signature, you can rank the drugs in your library by collecting the votes from all binary classifiers. 
that's the idea of kernel SVM. And we further ask that whether we can improve kernel SVM by relaxing its assumptions. Because kernel SVM have rather strong assumptions. For example, it assumes linear separability of your data, which is in general not true. So um, we consider combining the kernel SVM scores with nearest neighbor scores so that we can kind of get avoid of this assumption. And now um, our, our sigma score is a linear interpolation between the kernel SVM and um, nearest neighbor. So some sweet, right? Now we have a model well defined, and then we can just uh, train the model uh, on the library, and just uh, then given any new signature, we can rank the drugs. Sounds sweet. But um, actually, the task or the problem is not that easy, because in practice, we often do not have enough training data to build our model. So the figure shown on the right is a heat map of the number of data available in L1000 database, which is the largest transcriptome database we have for now. So uh, the library itself is quite big. It contains about 80 cell lines show as, shown as columns of this heat map, and about 20,000 drugs shown as rows of this heat map. Um, however, you see that the heat map looks like a blue sea with some green or orange islands distributed inside. Being a heat map means that we, we prefer uh, greener or red colors because being blue means that we don't have enough data points for, for some combinations of cell lines and drugs. Actually, among the 80 cell lines, about 70 of them are quite sparse. We don't have enough training data for many drugs on 70 cell lines. While um, there are about nine or 10 uh, cell lines that are quite well characterized by the drug library, and there are many training data uh, on many drugs on those about nine cell lines. So those are the nine or 10 green vertical bands showing up in this heat map. So then, let's simplify this case into a toy example to demonstrate our model. Suppose we don't have 80 cell lines and 20,000 drugs. We only have two cell lines and three drugs. So suppose that the first cell line A is fully characterized by all of the drugs. So remember that being green or orange means good in a heat map. And um, suppose that we have another cell line B, which is quite sparse, and we only have training data for the first drug on cell line B, while we don't have enough training data for the other two drugs on cell line B. And then if we want to match a query from cell line A into this library. This is rather straightforward because we can just train the model and uh, do the signature matching. But then, if the query is from cell line B, then uh, it is a little bit tricky because we don't have data that can be directly used to match the uh, query to the database. Then here comes our idea of dealing with such kind of situation. We want to carry knowledge across cell lines to handle those queries that are not well characterized in the database. So we first train a kernel SVM on the fully characterized cell line A. And then we use the data available in cell line B to tune the trained kernel SVM. So by tuning, we carry the knowledge about the cell line B or the target cell line into the model trained on cell line A. And uh, this knowledge carrying process is accomplished by a parameter alpha. And after tuning the kernel SVM, we will be able to use the fully trained model to predict or to rank drugs for the query signature. Um, so you see that there are two steps of knowledge carrying here. First, we carry the knowledge about our target cell line into our fully trained model. And then we carry the knowledge about the drug library from our uh, well-trained uh, models to a sparse cell line. So what do I mean by carrying knowledge uh, with the parameter alpha? Mathematically speaking, this is to add a parameter alpha in front of the big sum in the standard scoring function of kernel SVM. So the first formula here 
is the standard scoring function for kernel SVM. You have seen it in a previous slide. While what we did is to multiply a parameter alpha inside the, uh, in, in front of the big sum. Sounds simple, but what does alpha do? What is the biomedical intuition of this approach? There are two views of the functionality of alpha in this formulation. So the first view is that alpha actually shifts the decision boundary of the linear classifiers. Suppose in a two-dimensional space, you have two classes, one and uh, class I and class J, and you train a kernel SVM, the decision boundary is shown as a blue line, and then any sample falling above the blue line will be classified as class I, while any sample falling below the blue line will be classified as class J. So what the parameter alpha does is that it shifts the, the decision boundary in a parallel manner. So suppose we find that alpha is greater than one for, our, uh, for, for some query. Then the boundary is, is actually shifted down and to the left. Then the predicted class of the region between, this, between the old boundary and the new boundary will change. That's the first view of alpha. And the second view is that it actually shifts the correlations. So recall that we add an alpha in front of the big sum. And we define the kernel function as an exponential function. That means that we can move this alpha onto the power of the exponential, which means now our adjusted correlation is the sum of the previous correlation and the natural logarithm of alpha. If we find that alpha is greater than one, then the natural logarithm is positive, which means that we compensate for the loss in correlations when we are moving knowledge across cell lines. This is the second view of the function of alpha. So now we have all the required pieces for understanding sigma. Let's put everything together. Given a query signature and a candidate drug class, we train a kernel SVM. We interpolate the kernel SVM score with nearest neighbor score. And also, we tune the kernel SVM model with our target cell line. This is the methodology of sigma. So now let's come to the evaluation and see how well sigma do, does. And given a new query signature, we rank the classes or drugs by descending sigma score defined in the previous slide. And the quality of ranking can be evaluated with a metric called average success at K on some withheld test data. For every test signature, uh, we consider the prediction to be a success if the true drug or true class falls inside the top K of your predicted drug rank list. So it simply says your prediction is correct if the true answer falls inside the top K of your guest answer. And uh, in this presentation, I will present results for K equals 10. So we train on a cell line called HEPG2. And uh, we have about 250 drugs in that cell line, which means that uh, we are facing a 250-way classification problem. And we test on the HEPG2 itself, as well as um, one of the other eight cell lines. We compare the performance of SIGMAT to um, five other methods. First uh, is correlation. This is uh, simply a nearest neighbor uh, method with Spearman correlation are uh, used as the distance metric. And second, uh, RF is the random forest, uh, which, is, which, which is a very complex, uh, powerful, and popular model for multi-way classification tasks. Third one is support vector machine. Uh, so this is standard SVM without any tricks I introduced today. Uh, third, uh, fourth one is the KS statistics based score. Sometimes people also call that connectivity score because uh, this is a score uh, used by the famous signature library uh, called Connectivity Map and L1000. So this is the KS score. And also we put the performance of a random guess model here for comparison. So a two-fold cross-validation on our training cell line shows that uh, SIGMAT model has better uh, success at 10 uh, on the training model, it's on the training cell line itself. And also this uh, histogram here shows the comparison of performance 
when you train on HEPG2 and test on another data, uh, 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 another cell line, sorry. So um, you have eight different test cell lines, and um, the sky blue bar shows the success at 10 for the SIGMAT model, while the other bars uh, shows the performance of other models. It is obvious from, the, uh, from this plot that SIGMAT uh, have better performance than the models we have tested, uh, at, at least for this case, and we have more discussions in our paper about the performance on various testing cases. And then we ask, can we make our model simpler? Because uh, one lesson learned from this chart is that complex models like random forest may not perform as good. Because this is, uh, it is kind of surprising because random forest is very powerful for, my, for many tasks, but maybe here when you move across cell lines, things like that, they may overfit. So we'll, we want to ask whether the additional parameters introduced by our model are really necessary or not. So we have two additional parameters, alpha and beta, and we evaluate the performance of our SIGMAT model against simpler variants of that. So we have three simpler variants. The first one is SIGMAT minus alpha, so it's a SIGMAT model without the alpha or with a fixed value of alpha. And, and similarly, it's SIGMAT minus beta and SIGMAT minus alpha beta. Uh, this histogram shows the performance of SIGMAT uh, against those simpler variants of that. Uh, for many cases, or for most cases, SIGMAT worked better than its uh, simpler variants. Although there are some cases, like on the cell line VCAP, um, the SIGMAT minus L variance does work better, but uh, in a global view, uh, SIGMAT is more accurate and more robust than its simpler variance. This is just one experiment, and the two tables shown uh, at the bottom shows a kind of a summary of more experiments we did. And uh, the numbers, you want the numbers in the tables as smaller as possible, because the numbers are the times that a method is outperformed by other methods. So you can see that uh, SIGMAT itself uh, is outperformed by not as many times, while its variant, especially SIGMAT minus alpha beta, is outperformed almost half of the times by the correlation method. And so this is uh, one, one evaluation we have done. And actually, we have done a lot more than what I have presented today. Uh, we have done. 84 more evaluations on all possible combinations of the experiment settings here. We train on uh, seven cell lines, one of the seven cell lines, and we test on one of the two cell lines. And uh, we also study uh, how sensitive the performance is uh, with, regard, with regard to the percentage of drugs allowed for tuning and how sensitive the performance it, it is uh, with regard to the K value chosen for the success at K. And uh, we actually find that SIGMAT outperforms other methods or performs the best compared to other methods in more than 75% um, of our evaluations. So in summary, uh, we propose SIGMAT, a classification scheme for gene signature matching. And it carries knowledge across cell lines and works well on less studied ones. Uh, it trains the kernel SVM, tunes the third kernel SVM on your target cell line, and then it will rank drug uh, on the query signatures. It is more accurate and robust than the current practice. And although I have shown the application of sigma to the gene expression signature of links, it can also be potentially applied to other signatures like SHRNA and CRISPR. I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, funding agency, and uh, data providers, and I'm open to questions. Thank you. When you were doing your two-fold cross-validation, mm -hmm. are you concerned in how you're dividing up the drugs? Yes. Could, yes. So did you do multiple samples? Yes, so you can see more details in the paper. Oh, I would like to mention that the software itself is available online, and you can find the link in our paper. I, I'm wondering if you, uh, when you use random forest, uh, which parameters are you tuning? Uh, for random forest, uh, we we use, the, uh, we use the default setting of the R package random forest, and we allow it to select the features, but we restrict on how deep the tree go and also the number of trees. OK. Uh, I'm also wondering if two-fold cross-validation is enough to tune the parameters. Uh, two-fold validation, that, that is not for tuning. So two-fold 
cross validation is for evaluation. It is, okay. yeah. So you mentioned that you have a few situations where setting alpha to one actually works better than sigma. I was mm -hmm. wondering if you've looked at what those cell lines have in common. For example, are those the cell lines where, based on what you know about the biology of the cell line, it's much more different from the cell lines that have a lot of data? Yeah, that's a great comment. That's also one thing I wonder, because there, is, there are cell lines that uh, perform worse than others in general, and we raise this in our paper, but we don't have the insight of explaining it for now, and we do look forward to it. Okay, perfect. Time's up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks. Thank the speaker again. Thank you. Our first proceeding now.